You had an option, sir. You could have said, I am not going to do it. This is wrong for Canada. You're listening to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? And now here's your host, Neil White. And welcome to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? I'm Neil White, joined as always by my brother, David White. And uh, David, I'm back from Aruba, all tanned up, feeling pretty good. How are you? I'm feeling pretty good having stayed here in Canada huddled indoors and as pale as I am likely to get. Aruba is a beautiful country. I'd recommend you check it out if you get the chance. And David, if you missed the big news from Oh Brother, When Art Thou? The podcast is now available on Stitcher. So if you like the Stitcher podcast app, be sure to subscribe to Oh Brother, When Art Thou There? And you can get all the podcasts right in that app. Of course, also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Podbean, basically wherever you want to get your podcasts, we're available there. All right, David, now that we've got the formalities out of the way, should we uh, do a podcast? I suppose we could do a podcast. All right, then I have to ask you the question that I always do. Oh Brother, When Art Thou? Neil, it's the night of the 18th of February, 1945, and along the banks of the Irrawaddy River in Burma, a small group of dark-clad, highly trained special forces are sliding into the water, beginning one of the least known of the amphibious operations of the Second World War. All right, this already sounds intense. We've got black-clad soldiers sneaking in, amphibious assault, special forces, and it's uh, part of World War II, as you mentioned, obviously, in 1945. Uh, But they're in Burma, David, so tell us maybe a little bit about that theater. So, in World War II, the Burma theater is sort of a forgotten theater. Right, most of us think of Europe or the Pacific. Exactly. But at the very start of Japan's military aggression, they invaded China. Uh, That was well before what we conventionally think of as World War II had even started in 1937. And that was one of the factors that drove them to join the World War attack the U.S. at Pearl Harbor and everything else that they did was driven by this war that they had going in China and the strategic effects that it was driving them on. So one of the things they were worried about when they started the war was that America would retaliate by arming the Chinese, by shipping them weapons so that they could fight the Japanese more effectively. So to prevent this, they had to cut China off from outside sources of trade. So the two big sources were by sea, which obviously was the Japanese Navy's problem, and through Burma to India. And that's where the invasion of Burma gets started. At the very start of the Japanese War in the Pacific in 1941, They launch an invasion of Burma, which was a colonial possession of the British at the time, with the assistance of patriotic freedom fighters inside of Burma who disliked the British colonialists and seized most of the country very quickly as part of their lightning campaign, similar to their ones against the Philippines or against the Dutch East Indies. So have the Japanese been in control of Burma since then, all the way till the 18th of February, 1945? Well, when we reach the 18th of February, 1945, the Irrawaddy River is not exactly directly on the Indian border. So clearly, a large portion of Burma has been recaptured so that an Allied army could reach the Irrawaddy River to try and cross it. And indeed, that had happened. There was a series of epic military campaigns, the Battle of Kohima, the Battle of Imphal, which deserve study in their own right. But yes, essentially, a large portion of Burma was occupied by the Japanese from 1941 till 1945. 
Okay, so now who are these black-clad men sneaking into the river, David? Well, the one I want to focus on is their leader, Lieutenant Bruce Wright. And I can tell from your pronunciation of lieutenant that he's either British or a Commonwealth soldier, David, not an American? Indeed. He's a Canadian, actually. And why do you want to focus on him? Well, what's interesting about his career is that he is not merely the commander of the Sea Reconnaissance Unit, which is the unit we're talking about in 1944. He actually, all the way back in 1941, coincidentally, roughly some months before Japan had even entered the war, had actually come up with this idea that is finally being put into action in 1945 of combat swimmers, a specially trained and equipped group of soldiers who would be experts at fighting in the water as well as on land. So he came up with this idea in 1941. Almost does kind of sound like a silly idea, David. Guys who would be swimmers and soldiers. It gets even crazier from the perspective of the 1940s. When he wrote up his initial proposal and submitted it to his superiors, he was actually a Navy officer, I should note. He wasn't even in the Army. He wrote up this proposal, and he suggested they should be parachute trained so that they could be dropped from aircraft into the water, potentially swim to a target, and then destroy it. It sounds like some real movie-type stuff. Parachuting into a body of water, swimming up to a target, and then capturing it. It it sounds like movie stuff. It doesn't sound that realistic, David, but obviously Lieutenant Wright thinks this could work. Obviously, he believed in his idea. One of the crazy things to me about his idea is that he actually had it While he was serving in St. John's, Newfoundland as a harbor defense officer, he was considering how he would run an attack on St. John's, and then he decided the best way in would be swimming rather than on a ship, which led him to propose this as a potential method to attack the enemy. And if you've ever been to St. John's, you'll know only a crazy person would think that trying to swim in the Atlantic Ocean off of Newfoundland is any kind of a good idea for any purpose. Yeah, that does. I have been to St. John's, David, and that does seem like a crazy way to attack would be to try and swim into the harbor there. I mean, maybe in Aruba, the water's a little bit warmer, but St. John's seems like a tough place to go swimming. So he came up with this idea in 1941, but it didn't get implemented until 1945, David? Well, the thing is... He didn't just have an idea and then immediately make it happen because he was just a sub-lieutenant on duty in St. John, which was not the center of, you know, British naval effort. He was not at the center of, of the action. So he spent a lot of time initially studying his proposal and also studying swimming. He studied all the gear available for divers in the 1940s. He studied paddle boards and swimming fins and a variety of other swimming aids. A bunch of, you know, stuff that would be useful to prove that his idea was feasible. And then he had to propose it multiple times before he could get a hearing. He eventually got to talk to Lord Mountbatten, the head of combined operations the British commandos who heard him out thought it was a good idea agreed that a unit should get started then there was a long recruiting and training phase and then they went searching for where to put this this unit this sea reconnaissance unit into action well Dave if this was a movie all of that would have been just like a big montage you know some epic music a bunch of guys training him talking to the generals I could see it. It would be a great montage. I think you did a pretty good job of explaining it all here in podcast form. So ultimately, I guess where they decided to put this into action was in Burma. 
Why was that? Well, mostly it's an issue of timing. By the time the Sea Reconnaissance Unit was entirely formed, the planning for the D-Day invasions, which had, shall we say, loomed large in the initial concept of this force, was already well advanced and specific specialist forces had already been picked out to do things like beach reconnaissance on D-Day. One of them, W Commando, was also Canadian, uh, for the record. But there just wasn't a good place for them in the one big amphibious landing in Europe that everybody was anticipating. So everybody went looking around, going, where else could these guys go? And the idea of the Pacific was immediately suggested because everybody was expecting another big amphibious landing in the future in the Pacific, specifically the invasion of Japan. But of course, that was still years in the future at this point, the planning for the invasion of Japan. So Burma was sort of a convenient midpoint in the Pacific, but somewhere where they could be usefully engaged in their trade while waiting for the opportunity to be involved in maybe something a little bit bigger. So what are their objectives on February 18th, 1945, David, as they slip into the river? Well, this is one of the major offensives of the Burma campaign. The Irrawaddy River is one of the largest in Burma, and it runs through the country, and the Japanese were using it as their major defensive line, trying to hold along the river to prevent the British from pushing through to the port of Rangoon, which was strategically important because without holding a port, it would be hard for the British to supply their mechanized armies with all of their tanks. But if they could take a port, then they could put a more mechanized force into Burma, and then the lightly armed Japanese troops would be in big trouble. So this is a very important river to cross. And one of the interesting things is the Irrawaddy River had actually already been crossed once by British troops on February 14th, moving quickly. But then they got surrounded by, their bridgehead got surrounded by the Japanese, and they couldn't break out. So clearly, another amphibious assault was required to be larger and on a broader scale so that they could break through and continue their advance. So how many guys are we talking about, David, in this recon unit? It's actually a very small number of guys in the Sea Reconnaissance unit in total is less than 100, and then not all of them are being used on any one specific operation like this one. So you're probably only looking at sort of 20 or 30 guys total in, in action here, but they're more important in this big operation than their numbers would suggest because what they're doing is reconnaissance and it's communications roles that help to make every other part of the big amphibious invasion more efficient so how does it go david for the sea reconnaissance unit it's a classic textbook operation they slip across the river swimming identify the key Japanese strong points, identify Japanese force concentrations, and then use their communications equipment to guide the British forces crossing the river to where they can be most effective. The actual crossing itself becomes a hard-fought battle very quickly as the Japanese rush all available forces in to try and contain this breakout. But ultimately, the British forces, and especially the Indian Army forces, are too large to be contained. And in a surprise twist, they're suddenly being supported by the Burmese Independence Army, which had before helped the Japanese to seize Burma in the first place. Wow, so this turns into a big battle, David, all led by a few special forces swimmers exactly 
And how does it all turn out, David? Are the British able to get that stronghold on the other side of the river and get their mechanized uh, forces across? The British break through, and indeed, by the end of 1945, the British have actually seized the entirety of Burma away from the Japanese in one fast, mechanized campaign, vicious fighting involving troops from all over the world, the British colonies in Africa, in India, mule skinners from the Veterans Guard of Canada, and this small but surprisingly effective little unit led by a Canadian made up mostly of British troops paving the way for future special forces with a similar concept like the modern-day U.S. Navy SEALs. So, David, I suppose that Lieutenant Wright has been proven correct. This does work, this swimming assault force. To a certain degree. In the short term, of course, the British, at the end of World War II, disband most of their special forces to save money, and the Sea Reconnaissance Unit is one of the ones that goes, and the Canadian Army certainly was never rushing to take up that particular torch, but yes, very similar ideas about how to use special forces to multiply the effect of large conventional amphibious assaults just become common doctrine in modern Western militaries. Well, David, I thought it sounded kind of silly, but shows what I know. I guess it worked. Thanks for telling us this story. I'm always glad to tell these stories, Neil. And we always like to play a quiz to end off the podcast. If you want to follow us on social media, our handle on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook is at WhenArtThou. Or you can send us an email, ohbrotherwhenartthou at outlook.com. And do be sure to subscribe and like us wherever you listen to podcasts. David, our quiz this week is a women's history quiz because it is International Women's Month. So I thought... uh, Let's do a little women's history quiz. You ready? Let's do it. All right. Our first question. I have five questions for you. The first one. Who was the first woman to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol? The first woman to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. Wow. You know, I honestly don't know. It's a bit of a tricky question, actually. It was Rosa Parks, the famous activist. Uh, After her death in 2005 at the age of 92, she was brought to the rotunda at the U.S. Capitol where she received a final tribute, one that's normally reserved for statesmen and military leaders. So a bit of a surprise there. You would have not necessarily have thought of her as someone uh, who they would give that honor to, but she was the first woman to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. And what a beautifully appropriate tribute. Next question is a sports question for you, David. What was the only event open to women at the first Winter Olympic Games in 1924? The first Winter Olympic Games. I'll guess figure skating. You're right on. Fifteen women competed in figure skating, the only sport open to women at the first Winter Olympic Games. We're going to go back in history a little bit for this next question. When was the earliest recorded female physician? female doctor earliest recorded female physician i would expect it to be quite early indeed perhaps the 1600s oh even earlier than that david 2700 bc it was merit pata a doctor in ancient egypt who was the first recorded female physician wow all right continuing with our women's history quiz here on oh brother when art thou How many confirmed kills did sniper Ludmila Palachenko have for the Red Army during World War II? Hmm, I don't know offhand, but I will guess something along the lines of, say, 50? Actually, it was 309. Her impressive kill count earned her the nickname Lady Death, which I'm going to just throw out there is a pretty awesome nickname. (laughs) One last question for you here, David. Molly Cool was North America's first registered female what? What was her profession? 
first registered female nurse actually it was sea captain molly cool was north america's first registered sea captain and she was a canadian born in alma new brunswick the home of the world's largest tides that's our quiz for this week thanks for playing along david i always enjoy it neil and thanks for listening 